Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff D'Ambrosia, uh, who is a scientific IT consultant at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about uh, what LBL is doing here. Um, a number of years ago in conversation with um, um, one of their directors who was uh, new to LBL, we were talking about our domain consulting program and research IT on campus. And he really liked that idea. And um, it was one of the, the factors that led him to come up with this idea of, uh, of creating a kind of consultancy um, of experts to assist researchers um, up at the lab. And so um, it's exciting to see this. And I, I, it's very impressive to, to watch um, the lab build their team of these folks. Um, research computing has, uh, when, you're, when you're in that space, there are a lot of different platforms that are available to you. Um, some of them are locally provided, others are provided by um, cloud providers or national infrastructure. And so a lot of the, the work there is as a scientific IT consultant is matching the researcher to the right solutions, the right different platform solutions. And of course, one of those solutions uh, more and more is cloud. And so Jeff's gonna talk to us about um, his work currently at LBL in bringing uh, more and more Google Cloud services to researchers at the lab. So with that, Jeff, take it away. That's me. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jason. Very uh, nice introduction. That was, that was lovely. You actually uh, saved me a lot of words, so that was great. <laughs> um, I assume I can share my screen here. So I've got a little presentation to do. So I can figure out which is the correct tab. Which I believe is going to be this guy right here. That's it. We got loading, so we got a full presentation. You guys see the full thing? Excellent. Okay. Um, again, uh, as Jason said, I'm Jeff D'Ambrosia. Uh, I'm one of uh, currently three uh, IT consultants, scientific IT consultants at the lab. Uh, the other two are on the call, and they will get their shout out here a little bit later in the presentation. Um, you know, as Jason mentioned, you know, we we work with the researchers at the lab, trying to help them know about you know not only what resources available at the lab for their research uh, IT wise, but also um, we talk a lot about cloud computing. Um, part of my role is I, I, I manage the um, cloud computing program that we have uh, at the lab. So, um, so I might as well get started. So um, just talk a, a bit of brief background, um, just to make sure that we're uh, not mixing terms. Uh, I talked to our cloud program about some other people, uh, both this week and last week. and. Um, they were kind of confused when I used the term master payer. So I just wanted to, I, I'm sure all of you know, uh, but I just wanted to make sure um, when I talk about a master payer program, um, this is our contract with um, Amazon and Google um, where uh, the lab pays the, the overall, uh, the bill and we um, charge back users against their project ID. So I just want to make sure that uh, when I refer to our master payer program, that's what I'm talking about. Um, a small bit of history, um, there was no master payer program uh, at the lab in place before 2017. Uh, previously, users would either uh, have their own account set up on their own credit cards, um, or they would use lab P cards. Um, that was kind of the way to do it. Uh, a master payer program was begun. Uh, we started with Amazon back in 2017 uh, with four accounts. Uh, part of the process of bringing those accounts um, was for Amazon. Part of the process was bringing those users who had existing uh, AWS accounts that they were either on P cards or doing their own reimbursements and bringing those over into our master payer program. But it first started out with just four initial accounts um, and grew from there. Uh, from the Google side, the master payer program started a lot of the same way. There was a lot of individual contracts um, with Google, um, a lot of credit cards involved, P cards and whatnot. Um, and that began in 2018. Um, but since the lab itself has such tight integration with Google Cloud or Google services, um, it was pretty rel pretty straightforward to start bringing projects across into the master payer program. Um, this shows just over time um, the amount of spend that the lab has done um, for the master payer contracts since the inception. Uh, the blue is Amazon, the red is Google. Uh, you'll see um, a lot of growth 
over time, you'll see a very large blip uh, towards the end of 2019. Uh, there were some problems with some billing, so those aren't really accurate numbers. Um, but overall, the trend you can see has been um, a lot of growth at the beginning and things have tended to level off. Um, our spend over the last few months has been in the anywhere from the, the 70 to $80,000 range. It's been fairly consistent um, over the last few months. So uh, that's just sharing a little background of what, what we're talking about and kind of where we came from. Um, I want to focus more on what we're doing today, um, some of the challenges that we're facing, and also kind of what we're looking to towards the future and how we're looking to change things and continue to grow the program. Uh, this is a snapshot of our current usage uh, across Amazon and Google. We have uh, over 150 active, active projects and accounts. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're spending about $80,000 a month. Um, you'll notice that there are less accounts on Amazon, but we're spending more money on Amazon. And there is a reason for that. The reason is within Amazon, you have an account and that's what we see. Whereas on the Google side of things, you have your account, but within your account, you can create projects. And so you can have many projects and we track the Google spend at the project level, not the account level. So um, there's about the same, there's actually less users on the Google side, um, but there are more individual projects. Um, and as you can see, uh, I noted for Azure, uh, we have no master payer agreement with them. Uh, and that's because there's been really no expressed interest in Azure. Uh, there is one group that I know of that is doing some trial of Azure, and um, they went through procurement themselves to arrange that. Sounds like it's not working out great for what they wanted to do. And so um, at the moment, that's just probably going to kind of be the end of it for them. But we're focused just on Amazon and Google at the moment. Um, I noted a couple, I thought it'd be interesting to see what are the most popular services. Um, and so you can see the listing of the top five services. Um, unsurprisingly, the largest by far will be on Amazon EC2 and on Google will be the compute engine, which is the equivalent. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a couple of asterisks by uh, EC2 because in the reporting that we get, a lot of the services on Amazon uh, are, prov are provided by EC2. So if you use things like Fargate and some of the container services, um, the numbers show up actually is EC2 because that's the underlying infrastructure that th those services are running on. Um, but uh, storage, quite a quite a big thing on Amazon, uh, databases, uh, containers. Uh, you've got big table and big query also on Google um, and Dataflow. Uh, one thing I want to note is that uh, the lab is the biggest user of Google Cloud across all DOE sites. So um, that was kind of a fun fact for me to find out when I heard that one. Um, quick little chart. What we've done is I've taken our spend and I've broken it down by division so that you can see both a project count as well as dollars because um, it's I think it's kind of interesting um, and it's not quite today. This is from about two months ago um, because that's the data I had at hand when I was putting this together. Um, the largest user by far is IT uh, and that's not only uh, uh, the science IT side of things, but it's also business systems as well too. Um, there's a lot of little systems. Um, a lot of little projects, especially on the Google side, uh, but not a ton of spend for that many projects you can see. So there's a lot of little, little things going on. Um, you can see the uh, EAEI is, is a, quite a large user of Amazon. They have one very huge project going on um, that accounts for most of those dollars. Um, and JGI is kind of evenly split. Um, and then the other big user towards the bottom is scientific networking, which is ESNet. Uh, they are running exclusively on Google Cloud. Uh, they do a lot of a lot of work, a lot of their benchmarking, a lot of their traffic analysis, pretty much everything they do is uh, using Google Cloud. So um, what users are doing with the cloud? Um, some ways we don't know. Uh, I love this GIF, I'm sorry, I have to use that one. Um, but in a way we do. So. Um, one of the things at the lab that's interesting and gets uh, compared to other labs is that um, users have control of their own accounts. So once a user gets an account, they are in charge of what services they spin up, how they manage it, those types of things. And so once a user gets an, gets an account, once they have access, they can spin up whatever they need to. Um, however, there's a lot of instances where users come to us, ask us for help, ask us for assistance. And I thought I'd show you a couple of those things. Um, a couple of really cool projects we got going on. Um, 
one of the beam lines is using AutoML on Google Cloud. Um, and what they're doing is they're doing some image recognition uh, to identify this little uh, image, which I'll run here for you. Um, it's, it's trying to position a sample and it's trying to figure out the best positioning for that sample by identifying that loop um, the, the space of that loop. Um, this is something that the other science IT consultants who are on, uh, Feng Chen and Shaw, worked on. Um, it's really a cool use of technology of uh, machine learning. Um, and then the use, what the user is going to do is he's going to take that project that's running on Google Cloud, export it into a container, and then run it on his local systems. Um, another project was DESI, uh, Dark Energy can't remember. Uh, anyways, it's a it's an imaging survey. Um, they had a website running locally uh, at the lab. What would happen when, when there would be a large announcement of um, some sort of uh, some, some sort of new thing that they would discover? Um, their server, the load would get too high, and their server would crash. So uh, one of our other consultants, uh, Cold Deep, um, helped them migrate that onto Amazon using load balancing, auto scaling, so that when those loads would hit, it would handle it seamlessly and the, and the site would stay up. Um, another one, uh, there's a Knowledge Graph COVID-19 project. This is on Google Cloud. Um, there's actually, I saw a great presentation this afternoon on this. Um, they are taking, uh, ingesting literature, to, I think it was 23,000 uh, scientific articles, they said, and they're um, analyzing some of the research that has already been done to see if it can apply to COVID type of research, um, which has been really fascinating. Um, another project, also, uh, this one's on Amazon materials project. This is an interesting one um, where users can submit their own samples and their own data. Um, and it gets analyzed whether on NERSC, uh, on I think Oak Ridge, and I can't remember some of the other sites, but um, this is kind of a science gateway portal where um, the core runs on Amazon, but it also sends jobs off to other sites. So there's a lot of integration from them. As Jason mentioned, uh, we have a new Google Cloud contract in place for the lab. This has been kind of a big, pretty big deal for us. Um, a lot of uh, effort has gone into putting this together and this was just signed in, it's, it's active as of uh, September, 2020 for us. Um, I'll just touch on it very briefly. It's just three years. Uh, one of the fun things about this is, is that we were the lead of uh, negotiation. Richard Gregory at the lab uh, handled all the negotiations for this, um, and we are the lead institution on this, um, and it covers all of the labs. So every lab uh, and a bunch of other sites are all under the same contract. And what they did was they broke it down into um, discounts off list for compute, for storage, and for egress. And so compute across the board is at almost a 20% discount. For storage, it's almost 30%. And for egress, it's 40%. Uh, one of the interesting things about that is it, the egress discount depends on where it's going to and what pipes it's going to that location. Um, if it's going over ESNet, Internet 2, it's going to be pretty much free. So they take our total spend for the month. If it's $10,000, they say, okay, 15% of that, 1500 bucks. That will cover whatever the egress charges were for that traffic going over those pipes. Um, and currently our egress over ESNet Internet 2 is about 5% of our monthly spend. So we could triple our spend or triple our egress and it'll still be free for all the researchers, which is a great thing. That's everyone, one of people's main concerns is that egress portion um, and that spend of, you know, once, once the data gets into the cloud, how do I get it back out without costing me a fortune? So that's one thing that they put in place to handle that. Um, we do have some challenges. Um, and so not everything works perfectly. It's not perfect. Um, there are problems with billing. Um, on the Google side, when you're logged into your Google account, you can see everybody's billing and their spend, which is not a big deal, but it makes it very hard to set alerts because those alerts um, aren't working against individual accounts right now. That's something we're working with Google to sort out. And actually based on a request that we made a couple months ago, they're actually implementing some new procedures and some new functionality based on our needs. And they've been really responsive for that. On the other side with Amazon, um, there are um, other uh, players involved with generating um, some of the spend that we have. So as a user, if you go into your Amazon console, you don't necessarily see all the spend that's going on, which is, which is kind of challenging. So we're working with Amazon to sort that out. Um, there's, as a cloud user at the lab, there's no integration with cyber. So your resources on the cloud are yours to manage, they're yours to handle, they're yours to take care of. So um, unless that data comes back or there's some sort of integration coming back, 
with um, with uh, lab resources, um, cyber doesn't get involved with you. Uh, conversely, you know, we're we're very much uh, uh, our IDM is very much integrated with Google, but that doesn't work so well on the Amazon side of things. We have a project going on to do some of that integration of IDM uh, with JGI. So they're trying to bring in some uh, AWS resources, and then they're trying to use um, our IDM. So we have to do some we have to do some finagling to get that to work correctly. Um, on the Amazon side of things, you know, getting accounts can be a little slow based on how we do it. Um, that's an area we're trying to work towards getting better. Um, that's due to um, we're going through a reseller for Amazon, which um, hasn't been a great experience, and uh, we're looking to make changes to that um, because we want to have more control over the environment as it continues to grow. As an overall picture, the, the amount of time and management that, that needs to be done to take care of all this stuff does take a while. So there is, a, there is definitely an instance of, you know, handling that administrative overhead to, to manage all this stuff. Um, and since we're talking about puppies, that's my dog. I had to show that. So I hope Aaron doesn't mind with his kitties. Um, so for the future, what do we see as the future of cloud at the lab? And what does it look like and why? So when I think about what cloud is to research, you know, it, it's, it's a tool that's available to you, to researchers who want it, but it's not the only tool. There's a lot of other resources at the lab that work, work great. And one of the things that I always believe in is it's not gonna replace on-premises stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's gonna augment it. It's going to encourage additional on-premises resources um, and they can, collect, they can work together, um, but it's never, I think a one-to-one -one replacement personally. Um, you know, I, th I think the advantage uh, of on-prem is still too great to say, you know, everyone's going to shift over to cloud. Just, I just don't see it happening. But cloud's going to continue to grow. Um, there's a ton of services available and the resources that the, the cloud vendors put behind their services to build them out, um, to work on configurability, to work on APIs. It's, it's just, it's, there's so much they can do to, to help that happen. And that's going to continue to, to have people using it. Part of that's because there's less friction involved. You know, as a researcher, if you want to spin up an EC2 instance, if you've got your Amazon account, you can do that in a couple of minutes. You know, whatever you need to do. So that 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 is going to encourage those who don't want to manage their own infrastructure. You know, those those researchers who have servers under their desk, uh, who have their um, their um, Synology or Drobo boxes sitting in a rack somewhere. You know, they don't want to manage storage anymore. There's a certain point where people just don't want to deal with it. So um, that ability to, to remove that amount of friction, that remove that administration uh, is gonna help. Um, and one of the, I think for me, one of the big areas I see this happening is, is in AI and ML, just the tools that are available for AI and ML are just huge. Um, you know, conversely, you know, as I mentioned, cloud isn't always the answer for everybody. Um, the costs will usually be more than what you're gonna get on-premises. Um, you know, if you wanna get a, a VM on Google Cloud, and compare that to what we have at the lab with our with our virtual machine service, and you're going to pay more for for the the Google, and that's just that's a fact of life, um, and it's not always the best answer. You know, we've had some users who have migrated um, services and processes to cloud, and then have come back and said it runs better on Laurentium, it runs cleaner, it's faster, I, I'm able to do more of what I want with it, and that's great. You know, it's it's as I mentioned, it's a tool, it's there for you to use if that's what you want to use. Um, but there's also things that we're doing internally to grow cloud. Um, one of the things we're doing is we're really going hard after credits from the vendors. Um, we've gotten, you know, almost eight, close to $80,000 in credits, not $80 uh, from Amazon um, for COVID research, for uh, materials projects has gotten some money. So there's been a lot of projects that have gotten money at Amazon. Conversely, Google Cloud has also given a lot of credits. Again, COVID research, JGI, we got $10,000 in credits for. Um, for Gary's group and HPC, where I got them 2,500 bucks. Um, so there's credits available for the asking. Um, and we've been very aggressive about asking for credits for projects. Um, from the consulting team, I mentioned Shaw and Feng Chen and uh, Coldeep and myself. Uh, we're all very experienced with cloud. So we have this consulting team built to handle um, cloud um, in a variety of ways, whether it's architecture, training, onboarding. Uh, one of our new areas we're driving towards is prototyping. Uh, the, the consulting team itself has gotten credits from Amazon and from Google. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to help uh, researchers prototype projects a little bit so that we can then turn that over to them. And we have Google and Amazon paying the bill for that, which has been great. Um, we're helping get large, uh, large user facilities like JGI, uh, Molecular Foundry. And so we're trying to get them onboarded. Um, as I mentioned, we got a big credit for JGI for using Google Cloud. Um, and that's been great. 
Um, and JGI is also doing tests on Amazon because they want to be very cloud agnostic. You know, whether it's NERSC, whether it's Laurentium, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, they don't care. They just want to be able to take their compute where they want to. One of the areas that we're seeing a lot of growth is cross lab and, and cross academic uh, collaborations. Um, so where you've got different institutions working together for that cloud is a great resource for those people doing that because they can share those resources equally. So it doesn't have to be located on campus at Berkeley or doesn't have to be located up at PNNL. You know, you can use cloud as a common resource between the two and, and share those resources. Um, there's a lot of um, astronomy, a lot of high energy physics going on doing these types of things between Brookhaven and the lab and, and Sandy and, and variety of things like that. Um, we've been very aggressive about getting Amazon and Google Cloud to provide us um, training, uh, education, resources, you know, come do open office hours, talk to our users, help them out. Um, so we, we offload a lot of that work onto the vendors themselves to help our users. And um, one of the other things that we're doing too um, is really working towards the things I mentioned as challenges, really trying to work towards fixing those, you know, whether it's improving the relationships with the vendors, um, improving areas. Uh, that need to be worked on um, and also working on integration. Now, one of the new things we got going um, and Karen Fernser handles this for us is she's got an endpoint set up for us for um, accessing S3. So our researchers can use uh, Globus to access S3. And now she's also working on getting that going with uh, Google Cloud storage as well too. So that gives our researchers, researchers a lot of uh, resources to use you know, for things like Globus. You know, where do you want to transfer your data? Well, if you want to use Globus, you've got all kinds of places you can send it to. Where do you want to go? So that removes a lot of restrictions for researchers to um, really do what they need to do. Um, and that's kind of where we're driving towards. So it's uh, there's a lot going on, as you can tell. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to work with. And um, it's, it's, it's been interesting. So um, I think we're going to I think I've run about five minutes over. Sorry, Jason. But uh, if we still have time for questions, I, I don't know what you guys' schedule is, but I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to do questions. But I also, you know, again, want to mention Shaw, Feng Chen, and Cole Deep and myself. Um, you know, all the projects that I mentioned, that um, stuff that we're doing today, whether it's the DESI project, whether it was the, the beam line with the auto ML, um, this is stuff that those guys have all worked on. Um, and very, very, very um, in, in an embedded way. Um, you know, uh, Feng Chen has been hugely um, involved with the uh, COVID research that I mentioned, you know, building up uh, an HPC cluster within Google Cloud. So um, you know, there's a lot of expertise on our, on our consulting side, and that's been really, really great uh, for us to be able to bring to our users and the people at the, at the lab. Well, that's tremendous, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much for for that talk. I mean, I, I think all the things that you that you showed us and talked to us about underscore uh, the value for us on campus of of our partnership with you and and um, really tremendous to to see the progress that's been made uh, to facilitate you know use of cloud and also just the strategic use of it um, and the thoughtful use of it. Um, as you kind of move forward and facilitation. Yeah, one, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things I want to mention, I should have mentioned this too, is, is yeah. we do have we do have Berkeley people using our cloud services. Uh, as an example, Jane McFarland, who is working with um, a, a transportation project. She's a Berkeley person. Um, and so we've got her under our umbrella because she's affiliated with the lab. And so the group that she's doing her research with is at the lab. So, <clears throat> you know, so even though she's you know, mostly Berkeley, she's still using our cloud services because that's the main account and the people that she's working with there as well too. So, you know, there is uh, our cloud setup right now is not only limited to the lab, um, but, you know, we're also extending it out a little bit to, to people, you know, the building goes to the lab, but the, but the people themselves, it doesn't matter where they're located at. So I, I wanted to mention that. Cool, great. Um, so a couple of questions. There's one in the chat. I'll, I'll read it out loud. Uh, is the full cost of GCP compute more expensive than on-prem VM when all costs are considered? Or is an on-prem VM effectively subsidized for researchers? For researchers? I would say it's effectively subsidized. Um, but you're going to get, there's various levels that we have. So for our, for our lab, our lab VM, we essentially broke it down into a small, medium and large um, type of scenario. And so the majority of the VMs we have are small. And so for that, yeah. we charge 20, we charge 25 bucks a month. It's a great deal. Um, because it's, it's a great resource for those who have small needs. You know, you need a basic website, you need a basic place to store your compute. Um, the additional advantage for us that I see is we're able to integrate those systems with other things we have on-prem as well too. 
Uh, we've recently rolled out our SPSS, our, our, our full lab-wide storage service. And so that VM service has access to that as well too. So, um, you know, it's, we have the ability to lab to set those, those prices and say, this is what the recharge is gonna be. Um, and it removes the, the friction. I think we talked about removing friction earlier. You know, if you are a user of Google, you know, you can spin up your own VM, but even more removal would be, hey, Cold Deep, I need a VM. Cold Deep sets you up your VM, says, here you go. You had to do even less to get that up and working. So um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of our first machine service that we have on, on the lab. I think, it's, I think it's one of the greatest things. Fantastic. Other questions? Uh, feel free to just put them in the chat or just re uh, speak up. I'm actually reading the chat right now. Hey, hey Jeff, this is Chris Hoffman. Um, thanks for this presentation. Can you say a little bit about um, how you help researchers or even your own staff kind of get used to kind of how cloud computing is different? How do you address that? You know, for, for a lot of people, it, it's uh, many of the answers are there's no one way. And so a lot of our researchers are familiar with it to a basic level. Some of them are more familiar with it. Some of them have people within their groups who have a lot of experience with it. So when users come to us, I, I tend to like to, I prefer to treat it as a conversation in that when somebody says, hey, I need a cloud service for this, I like to kind of come back and say, okay, what is it you're trying to do? Because, you know, it's, they're looking at cloud for a reason, but it might not necessarily be the right reason. And so, you know, maybe there's a better solution that's not cloud enabled. You know, maybe they just need us, they want to spin up an EC2 instance where an SVM virtual machine would be a better solution for them. So one of the things that we do is at the lab is we don't have um, a form based um, uh, uh, process to get on the cloud program. Um, it's, we decided to specifically to not do it that way so because we wanted to have the conversation with people. So we want people to email us to, you know, meet us in the hallway, find us at an event and say, hey, I'm interested in getting, I mean, I've heard about the Google Cloud program, I want to get on that. And I want to have the ability to go talk to them about what they're trying to do. Um, and so some users will come to you and say, hey, you know, I've already got all this experience. I know what I'm doing. Just give me my account. Great. Um, some people, you know, they think they know, but they're not really sure. And what they're looking for is they're looking for that, that guidance to uh, talk about their research, talk about what their needs are. And then we can get into that architecture discussion of, you know, what is it you're trying to build? What is it you need? Um, how are you trying to augment what you're doing currently? And then figure out kind of from there what it is they're looking for. So we get, um, we get a lot of people with a lot of different skills and abilities coming to us to talk about these things. So uh, we tend to approach it from, you know, kind of a base level of figuring out, you know, what it was you're looking, you're trying to do and not what you're trying to do on the cloud. And then, you know, maybe that has a place in it. Maybe it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always, it's not always a, the right answer for everybody. Did, did that cover that for you, Chris? That is great. Something? Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Other questions? Um, I did see the chats and uh, thank you guys for your notes about the uh, master payer program um, and the naming as such. Um, it's something that I, the name is something that I had inherited and I hadn't really honestly thought about it in those terms. So um, I appreciate the, uh, the feedback on that, so. Cool, thanks Jeff, this is great. Um, I'm curious, you know, um, sometimes I've seen when folks, you know, have a go at the cloud, they, they see, oh, I need a machine, the one under my desk isn't big enough for example, and I need a bigger one in the cloud and I'm just gonna use it in just the same way as I used hardware in the data center and the machine under my desk. And I'm wondering if, if it just sort of anecdotally, if, if you've seen some of your researchers sort of, um, you know, make, make some of those steps towards infrastructure as code and what were the sort of carrots or sticks that, that might've, you know, take them along such a path, if, if indeed you had folks uh, take such a path. You know, th those those who have taken the path of infrastructure as, 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 as code um, tend to be much more experienced users. Um, so those that have done that, and there have been a few, tend to pilot their own ship, as it were. Um, they know what they're doing. They kind of want to be left alone, but they also, they want feedback um, in 
making sure they're doing it right. And I think that's a lot of the question that people get. So the, you know, they've got people who, you know, I have my server under my desk, you know, I'm trying to build and grow uh, what I'm trying to do. Am I doing this right? Is there better ways to do this? And so a lot of those questions for people who are looking at that type of thing um, tend to get addressed that way. And that's a lot of areas we, we bring in Amazon or Google to, to have those conversations with them a lot, um, not because we can't, but because a lot of users um, tend to have bigger plans that they haven't shared with us sometimes. And so when you get to bring in some other people and have that bigger conversation, you realize that the, the you know, they want to talk to you about a certain problem. They, they want to solve it in a certain way. But once you kind of bring that bigger conversation, you can see the bigger picture what they're looking for. Um, and so the users, you know, that, that you mentioned, those who are, you know, using services, they got the, the old server under their desk. Usually they're starting off trying to replicate that. It's kind of their first step is, you know, I've got the server, it's dying. I, I need to, I don't want to maintain anymore. It's, it's, it's eight years old. Yeah, definitely. You know, <laughs> The, 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 the fan is squeaking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, usually the first step that they're looking to do is how do I get that onto cloud? Um, and, you know, there's things you can do with that. There are services to migrate that. Um, sometimes we look at bringing that over to SVM, but um, but then from there, like I said, you know, I, I try to approach this more as a, as a conversational thing because I want to hear about the research. I want to hear about what they're doing. I want to hear their plans um, because the, you know, there's, other, there's other ways to do it. You know, uh, as an example, I got a question the other day about storage. Someone said, hey, you know, I need to get, I need to get uh, access to S3 storage. Well, it wasn't actually the, the right thing for them. They had very minimal storage needs and the, the labs uh, on-prem storage, I think is a better solution for them. You know, it's available for them if they want it, but um, so it's, it's kind of a roundabout answer for you, Greg, but it's, it's sort of a kind of all over the place. Um, but there are people who are doing, um, you know, infrastructure as code type of things. Um, there's not a ton of them. So most people tend to use pretty basic, basic um, type of scenarios, very simplistic things, but it's changing over time. People, people have much larger visions as the research goes on. So does that, does that cover what you wanted? Oh yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jeff. So um, the question, I, I, I was, we uh, hosted an event that was underwritten by the NIH uh, for use, you know, for a training from Amazon Web Services. And so one of the con perpetual complaints that I've heard nationally is the trainings don't address the real needs and use cases of researchers. What are your thoughts from a lab perspective of what you'd like to see um, become a solution for training for research? <laughs> It's a great question. It's actually something we've talked a lot about internally. Um, and I, I have to refer back to the fact that everyone's, everyone's research needs and everyone's direction is different. And it's really hard to create a very, um, a, a very generic type of scenario that will cover everybody. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. We did a training with um, Elastic Container Services, just essentially containerization itself. Um, on AWS talking about a variety of ways to do it, you know, whether it's Fargate, ECS, EKS, whatnot. Um, and we had 15 people there and everybody had a different need. Everyone had a different direction. Everyone had a different way they were trying to do it. And so one of the things that we've talked about is for those types of trainings, trying to do it at a more basic level where, you know, let's do a session on um, EC2. Let's do a session on S3 and talk about the various storage levels. And so we're approaching it right now is that let's have the consultants do that part. And then from there, let's figure out who's interested in hearing more, bring those people in for a much more focused conversation with Amazon or with Google. Um, and then for us, we're trying to do that as, as office hours. And we actually have one coming up next month with Google where um, I get a four hour block of time or six hour block of time from Google and they bring me you know, two, three, four experts. Um, and I get people one on one time. So I get one person, he gets an hour block, you know, next person, she gets an hour block and they can then work through their very, very specialized questions. So that's we had actually had uh, Jane McFarland doing that about two months ago with Google uh, for her research. Um, and so that's the kind of way we're looking at it right now is try to do um, kind of those more general trainings to kind of get people interested in concepts, things you can do. But when you get to that really, really specialized level, really start digging in on a one-on-one -on -one type of thing, whether that's us talking to them or if it's something a little more arcane that we need the people from Google, Amazon do it, have them do that. But trying to do a very specialized training to cover a lot of people's, uh, we haven't had great success doing that either. It's really hard just because everyone does it slightly different. Great, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, thank you again, Jeff. Uh, tremendous. And um, we are thinking in the, the, the planning group for, for the cloud meetup of putting together a panel uh, in the new year um, on cloud. And so hopefully we can get you back um, when that uh, panel comes together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And either myself or, or Shah or Feng Chen, we would all be happy to do it or the three of us. That'd together. be tremendous. So, yeah, that'd be great. Whichever. Yeah.